one more time. Y'all put your hands together and let's receive David Lucky and the praise team tonight as they come and lead us into a little more of the glory of the Lord. Are you ready? Come on, get on the phone right now and call somebody. One more time, just lift up a good shout in here and give God praise in this place. Come on, y'all hit it. Come on, clap your hands. Come on, anybody in awe of Jesus tonight? Right. 
I want to tell you, if you live, if you live in this Metroplex area, that's what you miss every time Tabernacle of Praise comes together. Because that's how we have church every time we come together. And I encourage if you out our way, come and, and hang out with us. There's a lot of great churches all around, but you may be seated tonight. I'll tell you what, I'm excited. This is going to be a great evening. And I know that the word of the Lord is in this house tonight. And uh, if you appreciated the band and David Lucky, would you give them one more hand of praise and love? And uh, my first guest, I, you, you really don't need an introduction to her. Uh, she's uh, the queen of the pulpit in this generation. Uh, what a great preacher she is, but not only just a great preacher, but she's just an amazing woman of God. Y'all put your hands together and show some love to Pastor Paula White. Love you, lady. Thank you, Gary. You are my friend. Yes, that is true. Yeah. Well, happy, New Year. happy New Year to you. It's going to be a good year for us in the body of Christ. Amen. Yeah, it is. Amen. I'm excited. Listen, I want to move down here. Just go to Tabernacle Praise. Come on, <laughs> girl. <laughs> we do it like that. We rock it like that every time. All the time. I've had the great privilege of preaching for you yep. several times. Amazing. And I was yep. sitting there saying, that's a fresh sound. There's yep. something coming out. And, and I know that God has always used you on the forefront to really bring a sound and to break a barrier and to bring forth where God is in the earth today. So we thank God for your gifting, for what you're doing thank for you, Tabernacle Paul. Praise. And Brother David, and it's good. It's all good. I do believe it is a fresh sound, and I believe it's a fresh season, and I believe that God is going to do some great things through the great music that's going to come out of this season because I think adversity and uh, hard times and tough times creates a, a, a gift. It, it, it hones on that gift to write and hones on your gift to do great things in your life. And I know you're no stranger to adversity as the rest of us are. We all have adversity in our life. We wouldn't be here if we didn't. Bishop Gary, I, in fact, mm. you've asked me to preach the message at the end, and I said, yeah. God, what are you saying to your people? 2011 is a very pivotal year, yeah. strategic for us, because it is the first year of a new decade. So right. we know that all first governs what happens to the rest. This right. isn't just the first month of a first year. What we do this year will determine the next 10 years. Right. We are setting a new cycle right now. Yes, we are. And so I begin to really seek the Lord and say, where are we? And, and the number 11. God always speaks to me in those numbers. Now, the number 11, See, you know, is not... My church is all used to this, because this is how uh, I talk okay. to you, so you're good. So, you're at home. We're at home now, and I really believe I had the word of the Lord, what God wants to speak to someone. Amen. When you said, you. there are people that are saying, why'd I go through that? Why'd this happen? But you had to go through what you went through. That's right. And, and sometimes when you're in the pit, you can't see the fullness of the palace that right. God loves. In fact, Joseph stands back to his brother and say, hey, don't worry. Don't be grieved. God sent me. You didn't even do this. God did this. Right. And I believe there's a remnant that God trusted enough to go through the adversity, to go through the difficulty, yes. to go to the pit, to go to the Absolutely. Potiphar's house for 11 years because right. he knew that they were going to be positioned to save much people alive. Absolutely. And that we're going to see God's goodness. But this is really what the Lord began to speak to me. And I want to minister on this word. Uh, the number 11, we know, is a, a, it's sandwiched between two perfect numbers. Right. Uh, number 10 is that number of perfect order. Divine complete, order. Divine order. That's it. That number 12 is a number of Government. governmental perfection. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a divine mm -hmm. rule. Yes. But that number 11 is, is sandwiched between these two perfect numbers, and it means disorder, mm -hmm. disintegrated. It means uh, <laughs> chaos. It's yeah. one of those numbers you go, whoa, I don't know if I want to. I don't and want to I go through Exactly. <laughs> I don't know about 11. And I started asking the Lord, okay, God, show me what you're really saying. And I always go to the law first. The law first is Genesis 32, 22. It's the first time we see the number 11. And it's when Jacob is getting ready to leave Laban. And he goes back and he's at the Ford Jabbok. And he's empty. That's where a place of emptying and pouring right. out. And when he crosses over, it says he left with his two wives, his two maidservants and his 11 sons. And I'm sitting there studying that. I'm going, okay, so a move is made after the 11th son. And I started thinking, and it hit me. Well, who's the 11th son? I thought, oh, oh, hold up here. Uh -huh. Son number 11 is Joseph. Mm -hmm. So now I start thinking, now wait a minute, because if it's disintegrated to shatter, to fall apart, disintegrate, it's the opposite of integration. It means everything being broken apart. I said, but son number 11 is the son that we already know preserves the seed. 
Right. We already know he preserves the seed. So we know the end of the story, and I'm saying, God, what are you saying to us right now? And I begin to see because his name, Joseph's name, means to add. To add. So what an odd thing that number 11, disintegrate, disorder, chaos, is the one that brings addition. So when I really start seeking the Lord, I said, what are you saying to us in 2011? He said, I'm raising up a Joseph company. He said, everyone who went through the last decade that had disintegration and disorder and chaos and everything looked like it was falling apart, I am sending you. You haven't been invited into this next uh, decade. I am sending you. Yeah. And I'm sending you to add because you are about to bring in governmental structure that you're about to bring in the rule that God is positioning in the earth that I don't wow. know what you've gone through and where you are, Joseph, but you're about to complete something. And when you step on the scene, your life is about to add what was incomplete. You're about to bring through who you are it, the completion of what Christ is doing in the earth. So I'm looking now yes. and I'm saying, all right, I, I, I'm looking for my Joseph's company. Yes. And I, I really believe I have a word for someone because there's so many of us that just went through all hell. And you're right. looking, you're going, why did that happen? And I'm sure he was in poverty of first house for 11 years. Yes. So for everybody that's been betrayed, for everybody that was lied on, for everybody that had a dream that looked like it was broken and shattered, for everybody that was sold into slavery and put in a place of bondage, it, for everybody that went into a pit, for everybody that stayed someplace longer than they expected to, for everybody that went through something that they didn't think they would have to go through, for everyone who was isolated, for everyone who was ostracized, for everybody who was mocked on, for everybody who has given up on, I've got a word that God has sent you. And this is the year in 2011 that you have been sent because you are about to add. And when you stand in your position of purpose, you're about to complete what was incomplete because though you came out of chaos and disorder, I'm speaking to somebody, someone who came from an alcoholic background, someone who came from a, a home that was dysfunctional and shattered, somebody that went through a divorce and their heart was bleeding and broken, somebody who they labeled you're not ministry material. Somebody that they gave up on said she'll never make it back. He'll never come back. The devil is a liar because it's been a setup. And out of that chaos, here, yes. God is yes. about to bring his order into the earth. Yes. And that's what Joseph represents because he completes Absolutely. it. He adds to it because his root, the root of his name means to add to. Right. And so it, it means to have union with. And I learned from my spiritual father, uh -huh. your, you know, Bishop Jakes, he taught yeah. us the power of a set. He, I, I remember him preaching last year yes. on Thomas Didymus, and yes. he said, one of us is in trouble. Yes. And he talked about the power of a set because, and that's a whole other message well, in that's itself. that's a whole other message. <laughs> I don't know if we got time exactly. for all of that one, but it's a, yeah. But I, I'll I share this thought, and then I'll let you talk here because I know I'm acting no, like a good. woman right now. And just, I want you. <laughs> No, you're not. You're being the prophet okay. you're supposed to be for the season. Yes, yes sir. That's and it. I receive, because I really, this word's are. in me to yeah. say to, I'm just calling my Joseph company because I'm going to prophesy to you and give you the yeah. word of the Lord as you get positioned to understand what you went through. And the power of a set is this, you know, a chess set, if you lose a piece, it's not complete. If I lost a shoe, I can't walk right. It's not a set. Right. If a woman lost a coin and she didn't have a set, she'll sweep a whole house looking for it right. because when you lose something it's incomplete but when the set is put together when Judas was lost out of the set the 12 the disciples mm -hmm. it means that they could not have the establishment of the kingdom so they cast lots for just one thing you never hear anything else about Matthias except for he becomes a disciple right. we don't know what he does anything we just know he completes the set right. so when they have 12 they've got rule again and the kingdom is established yes. what you've gone through Joseph is so that you can bring an addition for the completion of what God's getting ready to do in your family, in your city, in yes. this nation, in this yes. earth, because we are moving yes. in the greatest days of glory right yes. now. Yes. yes we, we had are. to go through it. We had to go through it. We had to go through it. I, th I think that there is so much to be said for just lasting, for just standing and just staying there and staying your ground when things don't look like they're working out the way you thought they were going to work out. And even the way that we prophesied they were going to work out, you know, but it hadn't worked yet, but it is coming. There is, this is the season of manifestation and change. That's what I keep hearing the Holy Ghost say yes, in my life, yes. that this is the season of manifestation of broken promises, dreams, all kind of Come stuff. On. It's coming. It's coming 
when it's coming. This is the season because it doesn't matter if we prosper when everybody else is prospering. Right. But when darkness has covered the earth, arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That's where we are right now. The glory of the Lord is upon the church of the living God. And Bishop, you really said it. For those that have remained, that's what Genesis 50, 20 says, you meant it for my evil, but God meant it for my good to save much yes. people alive, which literally, as we know, means to leave a posterity. <clears throat> posterity is the same word as remnant. Mm -hmm. Remnant is that which remains. It's right. that which has survived, that which is left over. Right. It, it, so after all the catastrophic, mm -hmm. after all the um, disgruntled, after all the chaos, that which remains is the thing that is left to swell, to survive. So we're talking to those that lasted to survivors. Yes. I didn't know. I, you know, I was, I, I thought I was saved. I always yeah. did. But I found out I was saved for real. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, I <laughs> you thought. You go through some hell, you, it will change exactly. your mind about it, won't it? I thought I really loved God, but I found out I really did love God. Yes. I found out that this was not just a gospel of head knowledge, but this was a gospel of really, this is yeah. who I am. And, and come hell or high water, when people were for me, when they were against me, when they turned on me, when they stood for me, when I lost everything, when I gained some things. Right. It, it, did, it was that I really found out that yeah. the love of God was there, the peace of God which passeth it's all visceral. understanding. It's here. It was here. And Gary, we've talked about this 18 life crisis, 18, nine years investigation, uh, a public divorce, scrutiny, daughter dies in my arms, going home saying, God, why can I reach the world but I can't reach the one I love? Laying right. on the floor crying, lost 17 pounds, couldn't eat for 14 days straight, a deep depression, everything that you can possibly go through. And I'm thinking, God, I didn't understand it. And I kept asking the Lord, because I'll look over my life like a, a, a master architect. I said, why, what I do wrong, Lord? And I'd spent two years prior to this, prior to 2003, just in the presence of God. And Gary, I saying, Lord, my heart, if I've done anything, if there's a fence, I'll go back, show me. And the Lord whispered, whispered to me, Paul, have you ever thought it's not what you did wrong, it's what you did right? Yeah, there you go. And I went, it go. hit me, I went. It took me a minute to realize, wait a minute, because I kept looking going, I know my hands are clean, I'm not perfect, but I know this heart is pure. Right. And I kept going, God, it's not making sense. And I said, what did I do wrong? He said, you didn't do something wrong. You did something right. Yes. And I believe for everybody who did yes. something right, that you sold out to God. You loved God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That God has raised you up for such a time as this. Absolutely. And I'm going to come back and speak to you because you are being sent to those that remain because you're about to bring in the establishment of what God is going to do. Not just the next 10 years, but I believe that is about to usher in the greatest yes. Move of is. God this world yes, has ever seen. Yes, I'm excited about it. I am too, I'm Paul. excited about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for just sharing with us up front. And, and I do, I want you to hang in there tonight because Paul, uh, Paula is going to come back and preach in just a few minutes. And uh, she's going to deliver the word of the Lord. And in that word, you're going to find your faith for your moment. And your faith is going to rise. Your belly's going to leap. Something's going to shift for you. Something's going to change. And you're going to realize everything you have been going through is for this moment. And I want to go higher in this moment. I don't want to let this year be a repeat of last year. It's going to be a change. This is going to be a different year. And we're going higher in the Lord. Come Woo! on, David. Love you. Go higher. I wanna go higher. I wanna go higher. I wanna go higher. I'm longing for your touch. I need you, Lord. I want you, Lord. I'm longing for your touch. I want to go higher. 
I wanna go. I wanna go higher. I need you, Lord. I want you, Lord. I'm longing for your touch. I need you, Lord. I want you, Lord. I'm longing for. I, uh, I had an opportunity uh, to be with this next guest uh, just for some uh, kind of real up close and personal and small meeting with a, a group of ministers. And uh, I did not know it was the same man. I had read his book, The Upside of Adversity, uh, Rising from the Pit to Greatness. You want to talk about a Joseph moment. And man, is this guy going to have some insight for you tonight? You need to get ready. Put your hands together for another brilliant mind in the body of Christ, Oss Hillman. Come on and welcome him. Oss, I'm glad you're here, brother. <laughs> glad you're here, man. You may be seated. Man, this has been like a setup for you to just Oh, man, I can't take believe it. Take it and roll it, man. <laughs> I, I was wondering why I was here. Now I know. <laughs> yeah, man. That's... Uh, what, what a tremendous setup, man. I mean, you, you went through uh, some major adversity. And so this whole thing of Joseph, I mean, just tell me, man, what is God saying in your spirit while you're listening to all of this? Well, maybe I should give you a little context. You know, back in the Absolutely. 1995, I uh, had an ad agency, very successful, 12 years, and, and was going along good, Christian businessman. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, uh, life really took a, a turn in 1994. And uh, my wife came in one day. We had been struggled and said I wanted to separate. Within three months, I would end up losing over a half million dollars and 80% of my business, and and it would be a snowball. And for so this ushered me into a seven-year pit experience. Anybody have a pit experience? Yeah. Um, and uh, two years into it, I just couldn't make sense of it. I was just living in defeat, you know. Right. And, and I think that's the way a lot of us you know handle it's stuff easy like to that. get there yeah i mean it's you know when, when everything you've you've built is mm -hmm. goes away you yeah. know you and when you have all three of those things at the same time you know and it was two years into that that uh, a man sent me an audio 
tape by a man named Gunnar Olsen, who was the founder of the International Christian Chamber of mm. Commerce, and he said, God is raising up Josephs today <clears throat> all over the world, and it's signified by them going through extraordinary adversity. Well, that was all I heard. I said, I got to meet this guy. And so found out he was going to be in the United States in two months. I flew to Washington just hoping I might be able to talk with him. And it was the night of a 75 nation conference and he knew nothing about me. And so he was so gracious to allow me to speak to him and go up to his suite. You know, that wow. in itself was a miracle. Yeah, it's a miracle. <laughs> and uh, so he listened to my story and as I shared my <clears throat> two years of woe and he began to chuckle. Hmm. Now, I don't know what you, you, what do you do with a guy chuckling about <laughs> your, your pain? Adver- your pain. <laughs> and he said, you know, Austin, I'm not trying to be rude to you, but I've heard this story so often that God is raising up Joseph's all over the world. And it's signified by them going through extraordinary adversity. And you probably did make <clears> some <throat> mistakes, but what you need to realize is your mistakes are not bigger than the call. You know. Well, that's a word. And as I walked out that day, I realized I walked in as a victim to my circumstances. But that day I walked out with a call and I began oh. to realize that God began to help me see the, the issues that I had dealt with. It contributed to that. But he also helped me see that there was a call. Yeah. And so over the, it would last, though, for seven years, I would be in this process where I was really living you know, by faith and just trying to make sense of it all. And, but all of a sudden, in the midst of that, I realized what God was doing was fulfilling Isaiah 45, 3, mm-hmm. that he reveals secret things in hidden places mm. so that you may know me. Yeah. And so I began writing and reflecting some of the things I was discovering. And I, I began writing this little daily email every day called TGIF Today, God is First. And uh, God gave me a word, uh, a scripture verse. And that's and an something people, I don't want to interrupt, but that's something people can go onto your website and be a part of right now, isn't it? Yes. Uh, the Today God is First. You got yeah. like uh, 200,000 uh, emails that go out daily yeah. with that. It's a great yeah. deal. I, I started writing that in 1999. And uh, I began sending it off my computer and just to friends. And it was, God gave me one a day for nine months. And I'd send it off, and I didn't know if it was helping anyone. And then after I missed a day or two, somebody write me and says, where's my devotional? I said, what do you mean, where's your devotional? You're not paying for it. (laughs) And uh, Where's my check? (laughs) And that was the first realization that it was really helping people. And I would get people write me and say, you read my mail today. You spoke right into my situation. What I realized was... God took me in such a depth of soul experience Mm -hmm. that it forced me to go in and discover those secret places, secret things in hidden places. Right. And uh, so today it goes to over close to 200,000 folks a a day by email. It's awesome. Incredible. And he's turned all of this adversity. (laughs) You know, in the midst of all of that, I didn't realize what God was doing. And so he was showing me this whole aspect of men and women in the marketplace and how we have often become Esau's, Mm -hmm. despised our own birthright for porridge, rather than really becoming the Josephs that God's called us to be. And you know, I was... uh, I thought about the first two, two presenters, Paul and Lance, and the fact that Joseph, you know, the reason Joseph was so effective was he was a son. Right. He could be a father to Pharaoh because he was a good son. Yes. He was a good son to his earthly father, and he was a good son to his heavenly father. Mm-hmm. And what I've discovered is that so many people are in the Joseph pit right now. And I believe it's going to get, get worse before it gets better for some because he's preparing an army. Yes. In, in uh, Micah 4, 6, it talks about that God's going to use the lame. It's a prophetic verse that I believe is the end time verse. He's yep. going to use the lame and he's going to turn that adversity into something that's going to be used to change culture by being problem solvers. And that's what Joseph was. He was a problem solver. And so I think that, you know, when we look at Deuteronomy 28 that says, I'm going to make you the head, not the tail. Mm -hmm. I think we've had that all wrong in in the body of Christ and, Mm -hmm. and how that's playing out. I think it's because God brings us to a point of great need, great adversity. Through that, we're forced to connect Right. With God 
in a supernatural way to get creative ideas for culture right. to solve societal problems. When you solve the problem, you become the influencer. That's yeah. why you will have influence because you solve problems. Yeah, that's a good word. So Joseph, you know, I love the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman who was probably not of the same political party as the disciples. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and he decided to hang out with her. And he spoke into her life, solved the problem. And then what happened? The rest of the city came out and inquired. Yes. So I believe that's a great model for us in the area of uh, solving societal problems and even the seven mountains that we see is uh, what's on God's agenda right now. Yeah, absolutely. And so those influences, those uh, societal problems uh, that we deal with, and, and everybody deals with something that's, that's related probably even to their workplace and, and where they are in life and, and what's going on in life. And how do, how, do we, uh, how do we get our voices heard? How do we do that thing that you're talking about? How do we approach this in a real practical way? Well, you know, we have seen over the several decades uh, the whole faith and work area. And the way I got in the faith and work area was through that uh, period of time. And uh, I began to recognize and help men and women see that their work was a calling. Yes. It was spiritual. And that's yes. why I wrote the 9 to 5 window, how faith can transform the workplace, to help people understand that your work, even your secular work, is a calling from God. Yes. And so once we get that down, then we have to understand how do I live it out in such a way that God uses that to impact the culture that I live in. Right. And so back in the 30s and on up to 1970s, the whole faith and work movement was about evangelism. And then in the 80s, it, it moved to uh, theology of work. You see, that's why before then you'd hear people say, I'll never do business with a Christian. Yeah. You remember yeah. that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and some of them, it's not as bad today. But the reason was it was the gospel of salvation, not the gospel of the kingdom. It wasn't showing you how to apply the word of God in your totality of how you do your work. And so in the 80s, uh, more groups began to teach the Word of God as an application to, the, to your work. And then in the 90s, you began hearing about social transformation. And, uh, and, and many, many leaders uh, in the body began to say, oh, there's a, there's a move of God in the workplace today. And that's where we began to see social entrepreneurship and social transformation. But today, I believe where we are is this new understanding that if we're going to change culture, it has to be by focusing on the seven strategic mountains, mm -hmm. cultural mountains, which is business, government, arts and entertainment, media, uh, the family, and the church. And these areas are what define culture. Right. You see, we thought that the more, if, as long as we get more Christians out there, yeah. we'll impact culture. And yeah. that hasn't been true. No. It hasn't been true. What we have to do is raise up men and women in these seven spheres. And to give you evidence of that, the gay rights movement, which right. probably, what, the gay population might be three to five percent at most. Mm -hmm. And yet they have used the arts and entertainment and media mountain to gain influence in culture and gain acceptance for their agenda. Right. So that's a good example where it only takes a small percentage of people to influence culture. Right. And Lance has been one of our greatest advocates on that message. Yes. And so I think what we need to understand in the body of Christ is that if we're going to influence culture again, then we have to strategically begin to think about those areas. And so that's where I'm focused these days is to help uh, raise up men and women to see strategically how to influence these areas yeah. in culture I, th I think that I think that's a very powerful thing I think one of the things that we have we've really lost and I say this often at Tabernacle of Praise but I think one of the things that we have lost uh, in in our influence and our ability to influence in the world today 
Um, and, you know, back in the 80s, that's when you saw people, you know, everybody that was a Christian had a fish on their business card and, you know, fish on their car and a fish on their door and, a, you know, uh, the Star of David or something, you know, just something to yeah. just indicate I'm a Christian, which made a lot of people when they saw it just kind of go the other way because... Yeah. Uh, that for one thing, they were afraid they were going to be pre preached to. And then, you know, and then a lot of times, uh, to be honest, we were asking for stuff sometimes for nothing, you know, just, can you just do me a favor? Cause I'm a Christian, you know, it's like, I need you to do something for me that you wouldn't do for somebody else just cause I'm a Christian. And it's like, you know, it's, it's really interesting to me that, um, what, through all of that, and then through all of our preaching and teaching in our, our little private club, if you will, of Christianity, uh, where we have taught one another, I think it's the, the idea of the second commandment. It's, it's the idea that, you know, the first commandment is no other God. We get that. There is no God but our God. So, But then he says in the second commandment that you have no graven image. And I think a lot of times we've tried to tie those two together as one and the same, just no God, so no graven image. But it's really a different concept altogether because he's saying, don't try to box me in or carve me out and make me presentable. It's not even in wood and stone, but it's even carving him out in your own imagination that God is only this small. So God is Baptist. God is Pentecostal. God is Methodist. God is this. And we have got God so boxed in. And what it is that the world is hungry for, I think they're tired. And they it's not that they don't want God. They don't want the gospel. It's that they don't want the image that we have presented that we have called Jesus. Okay. Well, I, I was... Um, I was with uh, one of the three networks, uh, a, a producer of one of the news, you know, major news programs, and we were walking through the studio one night, and, and she turned to me, and she was very sad, and she says, you know, I'm so sad to say to you that the Christian body has become known as simply a right-wing political group, yeah. not a body of people who love and care about people, and that, that said a lot, didn't it? <clears throat> that screams. And, uh, but, you know, I think what, what we're seeing happen now is, you know, we've got the Seven Mountain message that I believe God is breathing, not only in our country, but all over the world. And I believe the Josephs are entering yeah. into their time. And I believe that what we're going to see is these Josephs, because I personally believe we're going to see more difficult times ahead, because I believe that what's happening is he's preparing the lame and he's preparing the Josephs and, yes. and you know, Light shines greater in darkness, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. Unfortunately, we, i got to admit that. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, but I believe that we're going to see such power released in the church through the season. Yes. And I, I already see it, you know. And I, yeah. I, I, I counsel Josephs every week. They come to me. I, I'm, a, I'm a lightning rod because of my, my story. Yep. And um, I was talking to one this week, and I said, man, it was a tough case. He'd lost everything. He was at the, the end. I said, God must love you a lot. Yeah. Because the depth and width of your adversity is often proportional to the call on your life. Well. Wow. See, that's something, that's something that's not a popular message. No, you won't hear that preached Sunday. <laughs> yeah. You might at top, but you might not somewhere else. But it's because, and the only reason I say that, and, and I'm not trying to be callous toward anybody's belief for their, their uh, belief in God. I know God can do extraordinary things, amazing things, and deliver us from all kind of stuff. And we can be in the lion's den, and he can shut the lion's mouth, but it was still in the lion's den. You know, that's, that's the part that we don't, you know, want to deal with sometimes. And it's like, but I lived through through some of the very things that you're talking about with the death of a son, with, you know, all kinds of uh, horrific happenings that happened even around that, even in times of ministry during that time. It was very, very strategic, you know, because the church can be very cruel sometimes when it comes to something like that. You know, I mean, I, I, the first statements I heard were, you know, wonder what you did to cause God to kill your son. You know, how come you didn't have faith enough to save your son from death? How come you, you couldn't go in there and raise your son up? I can't tell you how many times I was asked that. How come I didn't have the faith to go in and raise my son up? But they weren't the one that stood there and watched their boy being wrapped like a mummy. And I never saw him, you know, again. So people don't, you know, when you don't live through some tough times, you know, you can say that, you know, you can say that it was gross for Jesus to spit in the dirt and make a mud pie and stick it in the guy's eye and the guy could see. You can say that's gross, but you're not blind.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, that's why it's important to really understand the whole gospel. And, you know, I'm, I'm finishing up a book right now called Becoming a Change Agent, The Rise of Social Entrepreneurship in Culture. And, um, I noticed there are six stages that God often takes a change agent through. And the first one is recruitment. Change agents rarely grow up wanting to be a change agent. Yeah. They're living their smaller story and get drafted into their larger story. Then the second is they're often thrown into a season of character development. Yes. And then they're often put in an isolation phase like David in the cave of Adelon. Yep. And then there's the cross phase, and then there's the problem solving phase, and then the network phase where yeah. he brings his change agents together. Like William Wilberforce, he had 69 world changing initiatives because he was part of the Clapham group. And they have a vision to do things together. And that's where Lance has talked about as one many times, where you have right. to walk together right. in order to leverage what you do together right. to have greater effect. Amen. Understanding the leverage of the body of Christ, as we said earlier, you, you mentioned that to me earlier, the body of Christ really understood our leverage and, and how much we can do together, how much more we can do together than we can apart. And fighting each other over silly little issues when we really should be coming together to see how we can change the world that God has given us stewardship over. I thank Oss Hillman tonight for being here. Don't you appreciate the great Thank ministry you. of this great man of God? Thank you, man. Thank you, brother. I'm excited. I want somebody today that is just, that is watching in this moment right now. I want somebody to call in. You know, you need God. I feel like there's somebody that's watching right now that is sitting here saying, you know what? I have strayed away from God. I've backslidden away from God. I need God in my life. There are callers uh, or counselors on the phone right now waiting to pray with you and bring you back. God wants to reconcile you back to your rightful place tonight. And he wants to restore to you everything that has been destroyed and taken away out of your life. And you're going to find out when you step in that you really weren't too late. And you're also going to find out that some of this journey that you have been on, that everybody else looked at you and even sometimes you judged as being just your flesh and just a thing from the enemy. And church people have told you you're out of line. Church fe uh, people have told you you're backslid and all this stuff. And you may feel backslid, but I'm gonna tell you a part of your journey was God working some stuff out in you. And a part of your journey, he hasn't forgotten about you and he hasn't left you. Call somebody right now and let us pray with you. We love you. We're gonna be right back. Pastor Paula's gonna preach and she's gonna bring us a word in this house that's gonna add to everything we have already heard right now. I want you to go into a moment of worship with David and the praise team as they sing the splendor of your majesty. Come on, you guys, and let's do it. Give the Lord a hand. Would you?
bless the Lord with us tonight. Say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, I worship you alone. Bless the Lord, say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, I worship you Come on, put your hands together one more time and give God a great praise in this house today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I know your hearts are so prepared by what has already been said and what has already gone forth in this house in this moment. And I know you are ready to hear the word of the Lord. I've already introduced her. Come on, y'all show some love to Pastor Paula White, pastor of Without Walls. I love you, lady. Preach to us. I am ready. Look at somebody say, you, you're sitting next to a Joseph right now. Just tell him, say. And I want you to get ready and prepare your heart. You can be seated and prepare your heart and get ready to receive the word of the Lord. It's not who you say you are. It's what you've been through that gives you validity to your identity. And so it's the process. And I came to deliver the word of the Lord for somebody that the season of just being processed, I believe, is not just simply over. There's always a process, but there's a place that you're coming to that you're leaving permanence. We're about to establish the posterity. We're about to establish what God wants to do in a very significant way in the earth. Go with me to Genesis chapter 32, verse 22 through 28. Verse 22, and it says, And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. Verse 24, And Jacob was left alone. And there he wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. That's a word within itself. And he said unto him, What's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men, and has prevailed. Verse 22 is the law first mentioned for 11. We're entering a very strategic, critical time for the body of Christ. 2011 is an important year of significance because it is the first of a cycle. It is the first of this decade. And all first are important because they belong to the Lord. He lays claim to it. The first always governs what happens 
to the rest. It is the principle of first fruits. God says your firstborn belong to me. The first of your increase belongs to me. The first of your cattle. The first day of the week. The first month of the year. All first belong to the Lord because whatever the first is used for determines what is going to happen to the rest. Can I tell you that whatever happens this year is going to establish the rest of this cycle. The next 10 years for us in the earth, you better hear, let the church that hath an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Your trial is not going to be wasted. Your pain is not going to go without purpose. God has taken you through a process. You say, God, maybe he didn't send it, but he is going to use it. He has taken you through a process, a series of events, so you could be put in purpose for such a time as this. You better slap somebody sitting next to you, say, if you only had a clue who you were sitting next to, just, just look at somebody, talk to your dog, your cat, anyone, and say, I've been raised up for this time. And so here's the importance of 2001. God always begins his purpose with a man or a woman, an individual with one. It's the power of one. And then he consummates his ultimate intention through a people and through a nation. God starts with one and he finishes with many. You had to go through what you went through. You see, God conforms the character of Christ in an individual to bring forth the transformed church so that the church, the true church of the living God, can bring reformation in the earth. This is our time for skeletal adjustment. This is our time that we're going to have an alignment. It's not so much that we're going to change something into a different form, but we're going back to the original because what God decided in the beginning is what is going to be in our ending. If God said it, he's going to complete it. I don't know who I'm here for, but I've got a word for 2011. And so in our text, we see the law of first mention, Genesis 32, 22. It's the first place 11 and his 11 sons crossed over the Ford Jabbok. So here we go to this place where you know the story very well. Jacob is wrestling with the angel and it's after he has been gone for what should have been just a few days because he was a con artist. He was a trickster and he had tricked his brother out of his birthright and so now he has to flee down to Uncle Laban's house for just a few days but he stays there almost 20 years. You know Struggle is highly overrated. Struggle's overrated because he's in hardship for 20 long years. He's in a difficult place. He's serving and, and he's struggling for 20 years. You know, God came to give you life and life more abundantly through Christ Jesus. And that literally means excessive. It means superior in quality and quantity. God wants you to have a superior life. And so he's in this struggle for a long time. And when he comes out of this struggle, at the end of 20 years, something begins to change and he says, I'm making a move. I came to declare that 2011, there's a move being made for somebody that is going to release you into the place that God has promised you. Amen. So when he goes after these 11 sons, he takes his 11, he takes his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons, and he crosses over. And here's the significance of it. It's after the 11th son is born, which the 11th son we know is Joseph. Jacob makes a move. He does desires to go home. And that word literally means to the place of his possession. I believe you're making a move to procure your possession this year. And 11 is a significant number as I started out. I'm going to lay this foundation because it's sandwiched right there between two perfect numbers. The number 10, which means complete divine order, and the number 12, which means a, a, a number of perfection with government. It is a number of rule. So here you have between these two perfect numbers, this very interesting significant number. It's so significant it has the same as the biblical uh, uh, significance as like the number seven. And so 11 though when you look at it from the surface doesn't seem like you would you, you kind of want to go wait a minute I don't want to exactly take on this number 11 because it means disorder it means disintegrated it means imperfect it means chaos it, it literally means imperfection so disorder is to disturb the regular or normal functions of 
love. Now, let me talk to somebody who didn't grow up in everything being routine and regular. Let me talk to someone that you, you planned a normal life. You went to college. You thought this is how your career was going to go. You stood at an altar and you said, I do. And you had this dream and your white picket fit. And you thought if my children are raised and they go to Sunday school and I teach them the word of God, you didn't think there would be a disruption in your norm. But I came to talk to somebody who had a disruption in the norm. You never thought after you work out every single day and eat clean that the doctor would tell you that you're going to die because your body is full of cancer. I've got a word for somebody tonight who had a disruption in the norm. You didn't think that, that your husband, when you were 40 years old, was going to trade you in for 220s. You had a disruption in the norm. Come on and talk to me now. You didn't think that you were going to be laid off from Enron and lose everything you had worked your life for. You had a disruption in the norm. You didn't think that spiritual son that you raised up that had been with you for 20 years would actually betray you and split your church and take your ministry and start a lie on you that would cause all kinds of stress to you, a disruption in the norm. I don't know who I'm here for, but somebody had a disruption in what they had planned as the norm in their life. There's a good thing getting ready to happen in your life. You better look at somebody and say, welcome to 2011. Welcome to your destiny. So disintegration means a loss of organization or in some system. It means a disillusion, to break down into fragments, to shatter. Uh, we understand it means to be totally broken. And can I talk to you for a minute there? Because God's ways are not man's ways. Uh, God does things very different. His methods often look like madness. Remember over there in John chapter 6 when Jesus was getting ready to feed the multitudes and hear the word with the word that I'm speaking. He's getting ready to feed the multitudes. And as he's getting ready to feed the multitudes, the Bible said that he takes these fish and these loaves of bread and he blesses them. And then he breaks them in order to feed the multitude. Now, here's the problem. After you've been blessed, you think the breaking is already finished. But the process and the way of God is not the way of man. So you were blessed. Come on. You were called. You were chosen. You were anointed. Hands were laid on you. You were empowered. You started prophesying. You birthed the business. You started moving in ministry. So you thought, I must have gone through the process because now I'm I'm blessed. But God's ways are not man's ways. You got the house. You got the Boaz. Come on. You got the blessing. You were blessed, but then you got broken. Because there's something different about the kingdom. When God gets ready to lift you up and raise you up, you have to go down. Unless a seed fall to the ground and die. I came to tell somebody whatever died in your life is not your harvest. It was simply the seed. That God is getting ready to resurrect and getting ready to bring his power and bring life. And so it's, it's crazy because it goes through this process of being blessed, then being broken in order to feed the multitudes. And it's strange because even though Joseph is son number 11, somebody say number 11, which is disorder, disintegration, imperfection, chaos. Even though he's son number 11, we already know that he's the one that's going to carry the seed. He's the one that's going to lead the posterity. He's the one that's going to save the lineage. Genesis chapter 45 verse 7 says, but God sent me, number 11, ahead of you. You see, you're a prototype, Joseph. You're going to go ahead of your family. You're going to break a generational curse. You're going to go ahead of a religious institute. They're going to call you a heretic and a radical, and they're going to say all kinds of things about you. How dare you preach in those boots and act like that and get up there and look like that. That's okay. I bungee jump. I vote my conscience. I've been divorced and I'm still called by God. You figure it out. So God sent me. I know it's going to mess some people up. And listen, I know that I know I'm not ministry material, but I'm God material. I know that I understand because it was through the brokenness and through the stripping away and through the utter of, of, of dying to carnality and flesh that God says, now, Paula, you're usable. It's kind of like fine flour. Fine flour doesn't become fine flour. It has to go through a process of being stripped. And so when wheat gets ready to be used as that oblation, which is something that is worthy of worship to be offered unto the Lord. It says it's mingled with oil, but before the anointing
anything comes, you have to go through the process of being fine flour. And so fine flour is wheat and tear stand up together. But wheat takes a different disposition because it bows down. And when it begins to bow down, it's because of the weight in its head. Tear stand up. And so when it's time to harvest or get cut, John 15 says that God does cutting before there's getting ready to be blessing. Because he cuts that down, which does not produce. But he cuts back what it is getting ready to produce and what is getting ready to be blessed and prosper in the earth. The cutting back in your life was not to hurt you. It was to set you up for the next stage that we are getting ready to serve in the earth today. And so when wheat gets ready to be blessed, listen, when, when there's cutting getting ready to happen, then wheat takes a, a position of worship. And the Bible says you can't tell the difference between the tares and the wheat because they look the same. But when adversity hits, there are some that are going to be in the church standing up like this because they're full of themselves. But there are others that are going to be bent down before the Lord. And the Bible says it's the Lord of the harvest that is going to separate the two. He's the one that says this is wheat and this is a tear and then it's cut some of you got cut and you don't get to choose where I'm cut you just it cut here and it cut my finances and it cut into my relation and it cut into my attitude and it cut some habits and it cut here and it cut this and there's a cutting in your life and a stripping and a, a, a process that has gone through and then it's bundled together and you don't get to choose who you're placed next to because God's gonna work out his character in you and he's gonna put you next to somebody that plucks your last nerve that you're going to have to love that you don't even like. And God's going to work out because he's not trying to perfect you. He's trying to perfect the character of Christ in you. This is about where they see Jesus and they don't see us anymore. And so until we look like God, act like God, talk like God, walk like God, think like God and create like God, there's still going to be a cutting away because he's going to bundle you next to people and band you. Then he throws you on that wagon. And when you get on that wagon, you think, okay, but the road gets it's bumping. I didn't see this and my norm gets disrupted and things start happening and there's bumps everywhere. And, and then you get to that threshing floor and you think, man, I've arrived. But you, you, you think it's over. But baby, it's just beginning. When you get to the threshing floor, it's just starting. And that's the place where the first thing that happens is you start getting pounded on and crushed. And you think, wait a minute, I've been cut. Wait a minute, I kept a, a posture of worship. Wait a minute, I've been bundled and put next to people that I didn't him like and I had to love him anyhow and God was working things out in me and different situations and circumstance and I've been through these bumps on my journey and all kinds of things have happening 18 life crisis I thought no now it's a place where it's going to be plummeted and stripped and crushed until it's nothing until you throw it up and watch God loves you enough to send a chaff and to send or to send a wind to blow away the chaff and to remove it you better understand what that chaff is that chaff, and this is how you know who the God remnant is, that chaff is a hull or a mask. And there was a season that God let you wear a mask because you weren't in an environment safe enough to be the real you. And so you had to play a religious role because the seed was not developed yet on the inside, which is where the real treasure in. But once the seed gets developed, then God causes the mask to be removed because you can't be relevant, Joseph, to reach the world until you've gone through a process because relevant means I'm connected to. I can't connect to your pain until I've gone through some pain. But now I can connect to your tears. Now I can connect to that situation. Now I can connect and I don't just connect to it, but not only have I gone through it, but I got out of it. So I can lead you now because I've been to a place. You better hear me because nobody can take you past their dimension of faith. No one can take you past a place that they've not been in their own life. I know what it is. I feel like preaching this word for just a minute. So, so he says, God sent me to preserve you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives for great deliverance. Can I just, can I talk about Joseph? I know we know him, but can I just remind us of a few things we went through to get to 2011? Just a few things. Joseph went to check on his brothers in Genesis 37, 18 through 20. And the Bible says they conspired against him. Behold, here cometh this dreamer. Let us slay him and put him in a pit. And let's see, watch where, watch 
where the battle has been over. Let's see what will become of his dream. You see, what the enemy has always been after is the divine connection of dream that has been on the inside of you. But you can put me in a pit, but you can't take my dream. You can put me uh, in Potiphar's house, but you can't take my dream. You can ruin my reputation, but you can't take my dream. You can leave me, but you can't take my dream. You can foreclose on my house, but you can't take my dream. You can talk about me, but you can't take my dream. You can lie on me, but you can't take my dream. You can hurt me, but you can't take my dream. Because if you have a dream that is really connected to divinity, it will outlast conspiracy and critics. That means no matter what people say against you, to conspire, to conspire literally means to join in a secret agreement, to do an unlawful act, to act in harmony toward a desired end of your destruction. And so they can conspire against you. Have you noticed that people that don't even like each other get together just to come against you? And so they came against, they can, but conspiracy doesn't move God's purpose or shock him. If your dream cannot outlive conspiracy or criticism, then it's not divine in the first place. So you've got to develop an attitude. See, th this is how you know. You develop an attitude that says, I love you, but you're not going to kill me. I love you. And, and, and you walk in that attitude. It says, I love you, but I'm not going to lose what God has put on the inside for me. Because you have to hold on to your dream and your destiny no matter who you upset. I know you don't like it. I know you don't think I still should be preaching the gospel. I know you're mad about it, but I'm sorry. God loves me like that, and I love him like that. I know you don't understand it. I know it doesn't make sense. I know. Bishop Gary, listen, they're going to get upset. I just got a phone call when I was coming in here. Kid Rock just called me, and he asked me if on his tour he's going to be preaching, or he's going to be preaching. I'm going to be preaching. He's going he's gonna to be praying rock and roll Jesus on his whole new tour, and he said, Paula, will you do a two and a half minute where you preach before I play that? See, there are some people in the religious community who say, I can't believe you do that. You better believe I'm about to reach the world and preach the gospel. And, and there are people that they, they're mad about it. That's okay. That's okay. Get over it because God benches haters. Don't waste your time or energy on those who don't believe in your dream and your destiny. They wanted to kill him simply because God wanted to bless him. Joseph, you've got to tell him, hold up. God's not through with me. You've got to tell some people, you're going to need me when this is through because if you kill me, you're going to kill the gifting. And this is the crazy thing. The gifting isn't for me. The gifting is for you. The gifting is for you. So all this that I've gone through was not for me. This gifting is for you. Everything you've been through wasn't for you. It's going to be to bring deliverance to your family and deliverance to this nation and deliverance to this country and deliverance to your community. And so God uses someone. You better look at somebody and say, hold up. You better keep me alive for a minute or two. How could they have possibly imagined that their treachery that they meant for evil would trigger the next phase of God's plan and bring about good, ultimately including their own deliverance. Genesis 50, 20. You meant it for evil, but God allowed it for good to save much people. Listen, your enemies would have left you alone had they known what it was going to do when they, were, when they were strategically setting themselves against you because the crisis they created set the stage for a great deliverance. Crisis is always the turning point for better or worse. Joseph is lied by his brothers, attacked, cast into a pit, stayed at Potiphar's house for 11 years. And Genesis 45, verse 5 through 9, in conclusion, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourself that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God, verse 7, here's your word, sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he had made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house. I'm just wrapping up what's been said all night and a ruler throughout all the land. God sent me. It has to do with an appointment that was made. It has to do with an assignment. It has to do with you being an image bearer of God in the earth and an agent on assignment to bring forth the change that you are being planted in strategic 
specific places that God is going to use you to influence culture and to bring forth the reformation that the kingdom of God, the royalty, the realm, and the rule of God is about to overshadow every place. I believe that God's glory is about to invade this earth in an unprecedented way. God has sent you as an ambassador. You weren't invited. You've been sent. We weren't invited into this next decade. We've been sent into it. So I simply came. I simply came to talk to every single person who had an interruption in the norm, to everybody who went through shattering, to everybody who had brokenness and imperfection, to everybody who went through a disintegration. I came to talk to the mama whose heart got broken as you held your baby dying in your arms. I came to talk to the person that went through a divorce and thought I could never be used by God. I came to talk to the man that lost his business and the woman that lost her health and almost lost her mind. I came to talk to the person who they gave up on and said, God can't use you. It's over. You've done this or that happened to you. Joseph, I'm looking for my Joseph company because God is positioning you for such a time as this. I came to tell you that 2011 is your year because Joseph, even though you're son number 11, your name means to add. And when you take your position of purpose, you are about to add the completion because without you, without you, when you come on the scene, 11, if you add one, takes us to 12, you'll bring everything into establishment where the rule of God is going to come forth. Joseph, you're about to establish the plan of God in media, in marketplace, in government. You're about to establish it in the church. You're about to establish it in every realm of influence. Listen, I'm about to establish it. The royalty, the rule, and the realm, right in Kid Rock's concert and beyond. You better hear me because God that no man can shut. Joseph, you're an influencer to the influencers and you had to go through the hell. So 2011 is your year that you have been sent to set up the kingdom of God. To you have been sent that the next decade there is going to be a divine reversal of manifestation of the greatness of God. Stop complaining about what you went through. You're going to put your hands together and give God some praise for some things that caused you a lot of hell and a lot of heartache. Joseph, you are sent. You weren't invited, but the minute you step on scene, your life is going to add and it's going to complete. And what was disintegrated, which means the opposite of integration, okay? It means to be broken. What was broken and falling apart, when you come in, it's going to be pulled back together. Your presence is about to bring the purpose of God in the earth. Joseph, you've been sent. Every single person that went through the disorder, this disorganization, I I want you to rec recognize that you're part of a remnant that's been raised up and the greatest gift God gave you was the adversity that made you. He has developed and cultivated you so you could be planted because this is the year for the church. This is the year for the kingdom of God.